Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ and a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition and ICAD USA. We're delighted today uh, um, to host Josh Viss, leader for the Reformed Church in America on Israel and Palestine, and his hard-hitting documentary, The Law and the Prophets, that you viewed this past week, as well as three of the participants in the film, Palestinian-American businessman Sam Bahor, Yahav Zohar from Green Olive Tours, and Sawa Duebis of Military Court Watch. The film documents in precise detail the various matrices of control of the Israeli occupation. Today's program is being co-sponsored by Friends of Sabeel North America, FASNA, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church, USA, the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network, Kairos West Michigan, United Methodist for Kairos Response, and Voices from the Holy Land. So thank you to our co-sponsors. Josh, your documentary is a, a comprehensive tour de force. And if you don't mind me saying so, uh, your mom and dad, Sally and Marlon, who spent years in Jerusalem as Reformed Church in America mission workers, were both executive producers and partners with you in this uh, act of solidarity. Tell us, Josh, what was the inspiration that lay behind your making of the film about the mechanisms of control that Israel deploys to subjugate Palestinians and your choices of individuals uh, to interview for the film? Yeah, thanks, Michael, and thanks for doing this. Thanks for hosting this. Um, and thanks to all the co-sponsors, of course. And thanks for mention mentioning my parents, because this work that I do began with them and uh, in 2006. And I took over in 2016. And it was at that point that it felt like things were shifting a bit uh, here in the United States and around the world. And I think that shift is being realized, though not um in leadership around the world um and so when i took over i started looking for uh, more ways to engage people on our tours uh on the israeli occupation and i slowly found these folks um in 2000 fall of 2016 was the first tour i did by myself and somebody recommended uh, Sawan Gerard of Military Court Watch. So I reached out to them and they came and gave their presentation to my group. And frankly, though I knew a fair amount about what I was getting myself into in this work, uh, I quickly realized I had a lot to learn. And uh, I was really quite stunned by their presentation on uh, child detention and the yeah. military courts. And then just slowly, I, I, you know, the network of people who do this kind of work in Israel and Palestine were brought to my attention. And I added people like Sam. And uh, I had a gentleman named Yaniv, and then he stopped doing that work. And he introduced me to Yahav. And then I found Jonathan Cook on the internet, reached out to him. And uh, somebody recommended Sahar to me. And Yahav put me in contact with Itamar. Uh, my parents had already uh, been in contact and were using Daoud. So it was a real sort of organic process for me. Um, and I found them individually uh, compelling um, and brave. And I admired them and I still do. And um, my groups, thankfully, who were and, and still are, sort of middle of the road Americans politically. Um, they, I don't work for a terribly left-leaning denomination, but not necessarily an evangelical denomination. 
Um, and they were just really compelled by what they heard um, from these individuals, and which I was very pleased with, obviously. And slowly the tours, though I still do a lot of teaching of the biblical and historical stuff on the tours, uh, their work and their insight and their presence really became the focal point of yeah. the tours. It was the thing that people talked about at the end of the tours, all they learned um, and how much they admired these folks. So yeah, it was sort of a, over the course of a few years, 2016 to maybe 2018, 19, that I assembled um, these folks on my tours. So that's the, that's the, that's how it happened. That's how we got to this point. And then in 2019, just to sort of wrap up, I, uh, I thought about taping them, interviewing them. Um, and I asked them if they'd be willing, Jonathan, I, did I mention Jonathan Cook? I yes, think I did. Did. Uh -huh. Okay, good. I don't want to forget anybody. I had a list, but then I didn't look at it. <laughs> um, and, uh, I decided that, you know, I should try and get these folks on tape and then do something with that so that more people, rather than just the people that go on my tours, I mean, I take, you know, maybe 40 people a year, max, roughly. That's just not very many people. And um, they just, their, their presence, their work, their information deserves to be disseminated widely. Um, because I found it's just life-changing stuff for people who hear it. So uh, we went in March 2020, which ended up being a uh, not wow. exactly fortuitous moment in world history to do this, but we were able to get to everyone um, before we had to leave the country and do these interviews. And then we had to figure out what to do with them. And that, again, was an organic process uh, between myself and Eric Scrotenbohr, who was one of the cameramen, sort of the lead camera person with Mark Chamberlain. And then Paul Westlink was the sound person. And we tried to figure out what we had. You know, we had 20, 25 hours of interview footage. And how would how could we package it in a compelling way? And we just started working through it and started piecing things together, trying to figure out the most compelling way we could present uh, their work. Well, compelling it is. And uh, like I say, uh, you know, there's a lot of these kinds of solidarity sorts of documentaries out here, but this, and maybe it's because I know most of the people that you interviewed, but, and, and visit with them, but it is compelling. That's a good word. And it is a tour de force. And we're grateful for the time and energy you and your guests spent so I want to turn now, Josh, uh, if you don't mind, to uh, Please, our, our guests. And so Sawa, Yahav, and uh, Sam, welcome, and I want to get right to it, okay? Uh, on, on May 11th, covering a raid by the Israeli military on the Janine refugee camp, Shireen Abu Akhle was murdered while wearing her blue press vest. And just in the last couple of days, uh, Israel has admitted to this, they call it an accident. And even more, she was just uh, the latest journal journalist uh, to be killed by Israel. Journalists Without Borders has reported that uh, scores of journalists have been killed while working in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories since 2000 without any accountability for Israel. I want you to talk a little bit about the attack on truth telling. And uh, Sawa, why don't we begin with you? Thank you, Michael. Thank you to the co-sponsors. Thank you, Josh, for this amazing uh, work. Um, um, I'm very pri privileged to be to, to have met Josh and to be part of this um, project. In my opinion, um, muting the truth is uh, is the item number one on the agenda of the Israeli government. It started from day one because they had lots of problem on all sorts of uh, levels. Uh, you know, on one, on one hand, they kind of um, um, uh, quote the law when it suits them. And on other times, they kind of dismiss it and they say, oh, the law doesn't apply. apply. And I'm talking about the law of occupation. So a lot of effort has been put into um, 
putting a, a, a kind of pretty face to an ugly story. And it, uh, it was done in all sorts of ways by uh, attacking journalists, by attacking activists, um, by coming with a counter story that didn't really make much sense. Uh, one uh, um, um, point I always ad admire is probably not the right word, but I, it always gets uh, my attention, is when the other side says, well, you know, it's a complicated story. And that's, <laughs> that's perfect if you want to hide things, you, come, you make it sound complicated. And uh, on it goes, here we are 54 years, I think. And the, the same tactic is being applied. Uh, killing Shirin Abu Akli is kind of the most recent tragic uh, uh, event. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, th th this is our job is to tell a good story in a compelling way and not pay attention to the counter story as much as we can. Thank you, Sawa. Yahav? Um, yeah, I think uh, silencing is, is an important aspect of this kind of crime. Uh, I'm not sure, I think, in the case uh, of Shirin Abu Akleh is just the almost now we're used to it case of some Israeli soldier without an order, just playing at shooting targets uh, in a space where Palestinians are very much dehumanized and there's not really a lot of distinction sometimes between journalists or just anybody who might be there. Um, and that's, I mean, Shirin Abu Akle we heard about because we know her, because she's a yeah. face, but there's so many people who are killed in just almost entirely random, arbitrary circumstances uh, as bystanders, as passerby, as, um, and there's virtually never, like this case might have some repercussions for the shooter. It hasn't yet at all, but it might because it's so high profile. Uh, but so many others are killed in not different or not very different circumstances. And it's basically the policy of the Israeli army not to really investigate, never to punish anybody. Uh, but there is very active uh, silencing going on. I think a, a very powerful example is uh, declaring a whole host of Palestinian human rights organizations uh, as terrorist organizations. Yeah. I don't remember the date of when that happened, but uh, in, uh, maybe not a coincidence, several of these organizations involved in research that might bring to international court cases against the Minister of Defense who issued that order uh, and other people senior in the Israeli military. So in their minds and the Israeli government collecting information and documentation of their actions is terrorism, right? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. basically what they're accusing these organizations of. <coughs> uh, so yeah, I think the killing of Shirin Abu Akleh is, is terrible, but it's, there's also a much larger systemic attempt at silencing True truth silencing yeah. information. Well, in, in each one of your own ways, and I think Josh did a good job because uh, all the people he, he interviewed for the film, each in your own way are truth tellers. And of course, that becomes a threat. And I'm glad you brought up these six organizations. Sam, I don't want to direct your, your response, but uh, uh, you're right there in Ramallah and a number of those organizations are there. I know, Sawa, you're right there as well. But Sam... Uh, you know, Defense for Children International Palestine, uh, Al Haq, uh, and others. Uh, why don't you take a whack at this, Sam, and uh, uh, this attack on truth telling? Sure. Thank you, Michael. And thanks, Josh, and everyone for being here, and Josh for making the film. Um, I, I think we need to acknowledge that Israel has successfully, over decades, been able to frame the, uh, the discussion. And that doesn't happen because of genius. It happens because of money put into PR firms uh, and scare tactics to bring editors into line, if for nothing else, out of fear of losing their own jobs. 
you have the Israeli military employing teens of students, Israeli students or Jewish students around the world as trolls going over the internet and finding any Palestinian uh, story to be able to comment on it and to question it. Uh, and if you follow this stuff, you'll see that uh, they're all canned answers. Uh, they're made to complicate the discussion, as Selwa said, instead of looking at the facts of the matter. One of the things Israel did over the past couple of years is created an entire ministry to defend itself against this popular knowledge base which is being created, which is questioning the, the, the sheer essence of the occupation and their acts. This ministry was created under the assumption that they wanted to cut off the boycott divestment sanction campaign. A year ago, the ministry was dismantled. The BDS campaign continues to operate. That says a lot, regardless of what you think of BDS. But the ability to non-violently address the military occupation is something that Israel cannot swallow. Whether you're a journalist called Shalina Abu Akle, whether you're six or seven, there are actually seven human rights organizations that are documenting the violations on the ground. Um, uh, or you're someone trying to call for boycott divestment sanction, whether it be the church community or individuals. Um, so this mainstream media framing and scaring is something that worked for them up until recently. They have done so many wrongs on the ground. They have crossed so many red lines, violated so many uh, international law and norms that they are digging their own hole. They've created a community that can no longer turn a blind eye. I mean, even the New York Times was forced in a way to put 60 children's photos on the front page to show the killings in Gaza that never had happened before. And I'll just note that some people are taking on this framing issue in a very serious way. I just reviewed two books by a Quaker American in Texas. His name is Alice McDonald. And he wrote something. One of the books is called When They Speak Israel. He says Israel is not only a country, it's also a language in how things are framed. I highly recommend people to look that up. But the issue of being able to address things in a calm, factual manner is something the younger generation of Palestinians is learning how to do. Up until now, the older generations are being have been more emotionally involved uh, and rattle off UN resolutions and, and yell and scream. The younger generation is looking at international law and holding Israel accountable as it should be. Thank you, Sam. Um, I have another question for all of you to address. Uh, many of us have been supporting the, the people of Silwan as best as we can these last months and years while they've been under siege by Israeli authorities, uh, um, trying to de they're demolishing their homes, displacing them for a City of David theme park, complete with a, a cafe, a cable car, uh, homes for settlers, stores for shoppers, a seven-story biblically-themed cultural center. And the, the headline from this past Monday's Mondo Weiss bears on the subject, how Israeli settlers use archaeology to displace Palestinians from their land. And they're doing this, of course, not just in Silwan. So I, I, want, I want you to uh, address how Israel is using archaeology to displace Palestinians and also, as you pointed out, Sam, construct this Israeli narrative around the Bible in, in many cases. And so, Sam, you want to start? Sure. I'm not an expert in archaeology, but definitely it's used as a tool, like all the other sectors are used as a tool to promote the colonization of Palestine and the continuing occupation of Palestine. Uh, interestingly, there are some leading Israeli archaeological organizations uh, uh, which are calling out the shots and basically saying X development is being done to cover up uh, something maybe that has been demolished in 1948 or something being covered over or a, uh, a cemetery in Jerusalem that they want to create a museum of tolerance over. The irony is, is, is mind boggling. Uh, so yes, archaeology and trying to create this biblical story without really the facts of the, of the matter because facts have not emerged. They've been digging this ground for the last 70 years, and nothing overwhelming has come out to say uh, uh, their story is any uh, more valid than it was when it started. So they've tried to cover that up by using uh, archaeology, and it's a, it's a powerful tool because when you are the occupier, you have the military force to create facts on the ground. And if those facts are uh, 
uh, an old looking cave just to say we were here, uh, you can do that. That doesn't mean it's true, but you can create an entire reality. In Jerusalem specifically, I assume my colleagues maybe have more information on this, there's an entire underground cave network and tunnel network that Israel is creating and Sawed is part of that to try to create an alternative reality to what's above ground. So it's definitely used like other methods are used to deny the Palestinians even the historical connection to the land. Um, and I said that the best, as I noted, the best resources that I've found for this have been Israeli human rights organizations. I'll actually put it in the chat. I want to look it up if they'd like to. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Sawa? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think anything is uh, beyond them. They'll use archaeology, they'll use religion, they'll use history, anything. What I find um, very disturbing in, in the case of archaeology is some of the archaeological uh, excavations are given to some radical uh, right-wing yeah. um, groups who are you know, cashed up from sometimes from American wealthy donors and nothing stops them, you know, no, no regulations, nothing. And they are very, very act, uh, aggressive in pursuing their, uh, their objective. And uh, Silvan is one such example. Thank you. Yaha? Um, right, I think um, both what Sam said, uh, the dig the tunneling under people's houses is in Wadi Khilwain in Silwan largely. Um, and so there is a huge investment there in that particular place. Uh, I don't think it's just an excuse or a means to get rid of Palestinians, right? They're digging those tunnels under everybody's houses. The houses are cracking. Yeah. Uh, but they're not doing it just in order to crack the houses. They just don't care much about the houses because they're really obsessed with what is below. And I think the, the centrality that the City of David organization has, which is this private right-wing organization, which is bringing in millions of dollars in donation and running that archaeological park and those excavations and moving the settlers in, um, part of their power is that the state of Israel or the Zionist project is sort of desperate for narrative. So, I mean, you have to have some story of what we're doing. Historically, one part is the persecution of Jews and the need for a safe place. But, and the, and the second part is a safe place is here because here King David, because here the Bible, etc. Now, the first part becomes less powerful because it's pretty safe to be a Jew in Europe right now or a Jew in North America. It's not entirely safe to be a Jew in Jerusalem because this is a very combative and it keeps demanding a, a lot of violence to maintain a, this Jewish state. So more and more, you, you need an explanation. And more and more, when you don't have, they try to drum up somebody. The Iranians will kill us all. Or, but more and more, you have to go to the religion and the Bible. And this is part of the shift right of Israeli politics and public. And this is part of why pretty small groups of these religious um, fundamentalists, maybe is not exactly the right word, but uh, these people who are driven by a biblical idea of the Judaization of the land have so much support from the Israeli system. The city of David getting a government budgets and the founder and manager becoming awarded the Israel Prize for, for life's work. Um, so this is very dear to the heart of the entire Israeli state, this project which is causing great suffering to the people of Wadi Khilwa neighborhood and cracking their houses and removing them from their houses and taking over their space and putting armed men on every second rooftop yeah. in their neighborhood is really because of this need, this need to find the biblical story, to confirm it, to connect to it, to have some, somehow a justification. And uh, Michael, can I just add, can I just add one thing to that? Absolutely. As an American who's studied archaeology and knows the evangelical <laughs> community in America, 
uh, and the Christian community around the world, actually, is that, you know, the archaeological projects in Israel, many of them were from professors and scholars from the United States and Britain. Right. And uh, increasingly and still, there are evangelicals who love to give money if the project is going to prove the Bible more correct. So these projects find easy money from American sources who don't probably don't even some of whom don't know anything about what's happening in Jerusalem, don't even know anything about East Jerusalem or Silwan. They just love to see archaeology on Earth that may prove that the biblical stories are true in some way. Yeah, I think that's an important point, Josh. Thanks. Uh, I want to ask each one of you uh, some questions now. And of course, the other two are invited to weigh in if you'd like as we go along. So Yahav, um, you're featured at the very beginning of the Law and the Prophets in Lifta. Tell us uh, why Lifta is a tragic case study in Israel's ongoing matrix of control. I mean, you talk about it in the film. Right. Look, um, the Nakba is is tragic, the, the huge displacement, uh, the destruction. Uh, I think Lifta, what's unique about it is not a tragedy because the tragedy is much bigger and wider. And um, I mean, Lifta suffered a Zionist terrorist attack. There was people through grenades into the cafe of Lifta before the people of Lifta fled, but that's really not unique. And the people were forced out, and that's also not unique. There's hundreds of villages. Uh, what's really unique about Lifta, and it's a sort of historical accident, I think, uh, is that it's preserved and empty. That you have uh, just the houses remaining. There is this very impressive memorial, something that's obviously was populated for hundreds of continuous years. You just look at it, it's a very impressive, uh, and it really is it's like a testament. It serves as a sort of memorial for the so many other villages that were in the hills immediately around it and have been entirely bulldozed away. Uh, so Lifta, I think, is uh, a powerful um, visualization of a much wider tragedy. Thank you. I, I want to follow up with you just for a second, uh, Yahav. You're a partner with Green Olive Tours. Uh, talk to us about how tourism is used as a tool of uh, propaganda and why so-called alternative advocacy tours like the ones you are involved with and Josh uh, and myself are involved with are so important. Right. Well, so there is a lot of use of tourism as propaganda, certainly by the Israeli state and uh, most famously, maybe the birthright trips that young Jews from around the world get for free uh, 10 days together with Israeli soldiers to uh, enjoy the country and uh, learn a very, very uh, a narrative which basically includes no Palestinians and is um, full of holes. And, uh, and then that's, that's directly committed ideological tourism. Mostly the sort of mainstream tourism just tries to avoid saying anything that might offend anybody. So most of the tour guides, most of the time who have the pilgrim groups or will just try to stick to where Jesus was um, or whatever the historical event and the place rather than touch on the present at all. And if they do, they'll try to stick to some generalized media line that keeps things vague or pro-Israeli. Uh, and so, I mean, we, we were really originally, the need for these tours we saw because of uh, the settler organizations organizing tours and the state organizing tours. And all these tours is showing the country without any Palestinians or without any Palestinian narrative. And with, uh, so we wanted to change that. And I'm happy to say when, when Green Olive Tours began uh, 15 years ago or so, I believe we were the only commercial company uh, offering such tours. Uh, and now there are several. 
uh, we've grown and others have grown. And it turns out there's a lot of interest. A lot of people who come to this country, they want to know. They hear yeah. things on the news. They have questions. They want to see just most of the tourism industry will shy away. Um, not wanting to touch any of this. So it's a real need, which, I mean, makes us happily a sustainable business. Uh, it's growing. Um, and you get a lot of people who really know very little and then become exposed to things and then take a stand. It's really impressive to see how much more effective this is than any let's say dinner table argument yeah, uh, or yeah, storytelling sure. to bring people to the physical realities, have them meet directly the people affected, see the things with their own eyes. It's a very powerful tool. Well, you know, we like to say here, you know, once you see, you can't unsee. And uh, Sam and Salwa, uh, my groups have met with you uh, regularly for a number of years now uh, in Ramallah, uh, Talk to us too. I mean, you can say a word about Lyft if you'd like, uh, uh, if you want to supplement what uh, what Yaha said. But talk to us too about the the importance of this these uh, alternative, what I call solidarity uh, tours. Sam, sure. I, I'm totally convinced that such tours are eye openers. Uh, more recently, we're seeing uh, uh, an influx of people coming for very different reasons. Sometimes people are just curious and they're coming more on a tourist trip to see this thing called Palestine that they've heard about, but they've never really witnessed. Others are coming in a solidarity mode. They fully are aware of what they're coming to see and they're coming to be able to create the human connections and, and learn what they need to learn to be able to make the case. More recently, I, I, I would say after the, uh, the several Gaza uh, aggressions uh, Israel had, uh, that they've crossed red lines, which very much confused the Jewish communities around the world um, to the point where Jewish communities could no longer defend Israeli actions. And they became much more curious to see what is it on the other side? What, what is this thing that we don't know about? Those are the communities uh, that are coming. I spend a lot of time with Jewish communities, mainly Jewish American communities that are coming. And it is an eye opener. Having said all of that, there has developed, and I just wrote something, a rather lengthy piece that will be coming out in a couple of days. There's a whole discussion happening globally now about the value of these trips. What's the moral way to come and visit Palestine? And I, I, I for many reasons, but one reason is I, I wrote this article coming up because this huge debate about should we go to Israel when we come to see Palestine? Should we stop and see a settlement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And I took a step back and I said, I'm sure there are better ways to visit than others, but overall, a visit is giving you a very, very thin slice of what the Palestinian narrative is about. Yeah. And I go through and say, basically, what do you miss when you visit? When you visit, you see a checkpoint, a settlement, probably from far away. You talk to a few Palestinians. You cannot see dispossession. You cannot see the fear that children have as Gaza is being bombed. You cannot feel what it's, what it's like to see Israeli jeeps coming into your neighborhood every single night. There are in cities around, across the West Bank uh, to arrest people. And as we're seeing, we're waking up daily now to people being killed because overnight the Israelis invaded our cities to arrest someone and got shot at or uh, a clash incurred. All, all of that and so much more, you don't see. So the trips are important. But we should not become overwhelmed by the trip being the, uh, the everything. It's not a, a one-shot deal that you come and see and now you understand. You yeah. started a journey when you came and see, you, we came and saw. To fully understand the weight of this conflict, uh, much more is needed. And you can do that by coming or uh, on your own. Last thing I'll note is, and this is how I close my article, thank God we don't need to have the full set of information before we act on anything. That's right. A judge that has a rapist in front of her uh, bench need not have gone through a rape experience herself to bring that person to justice. And the same thing. Once we have enough information, we don't have to go through occupation ourselves or understand every element of occupation 
before we act to hold the occupier accountable. And that's ultimately what I hope that these trips reach, trips reach, people who are willing to act, to hold Israel accountable and to hold the US accountable. If you're coming from the US, you need to hold your own government accountable because without the US, there is no military occupation. A absolutely, Sam, thank you for that. Salwa? Yeah, I completely agree. I'll just add a few um, points. I think people don't like to be lied to. People want to know the truths as they are. Uh, and we see this more and more everywhere. And uh, um, especially among young Jewish uh, American uh, students who come here, let's say on uh, birthright trips, and they get a completely 100% Israeli narrative and they don't like it. They want to know the Palestinian uh, narrative. They want to meet Palestinians. They want to understand the conflict from their uh, perspective. And that I think uh, will eventually be a game changer. Um, nobody likes to be, it wants to be lied to. Second point is solidarity. Uh, visits are extremely important. You know, Palestinians feel that they are on their own facing this um, issue, the, the multiple, multiple problems in this giant. So solidarity is very important. I think equally important is that we um, find a way to try to mainstream this issue. You know, we speak to our friends, we speak to people who already know, we speak to people who have visited and agree with us and know what is going on. But we, what we are not good at is trying to appeal to more conservative audiences, people who, you know, maybe have a little bit of an open mind to try and uh, understand. And we have to kind of find the language, find the, the uh, approach that will bring these people in. Because without mainstreaming the issue, we will never be able to change things on the ground. One final point, I completely agree with Sam. Most of the um, um, it, it, problems that Palestinians suffer from cannot be seen physically. How can uh, you know a group of 40 people visiting the occupied territory understand or uh, uh, feel the impact, for example, of a night raid on women, repeated night raids, what on child arrest? You know, none of them will actually see or experience a night raid. I mean, it's very important that they talk to people who have experienced it. But um, my point is the, uh, this occupation hides behind the unseen stories, the stories that cannot be told, the stories that don't make it to the media, the stories that are not tangible, you know, the psychological damage, the fear, um, the hopelessness. How can you tell those stories to people who want to know? That's so, well, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's my next question. I want to direct it to you because that's what you and Gerard document. Uh, I mean, you do amazing work uh, monitoring the conditions and treatments of Palestinian children and youth during their most vulnerable times after Israeli military night raids, uh, their arrest, detention, they're part of the military uh, uh, legal system. Blind, uh, uh, blindfolded, bound, beaten, hungry, sleep deprived, you know, uh, uh, intimidated into confessions, all the rest. And even after they're released, the terror and the trauma continue. So that's what I want you to just talk about for a minute or so. Uh, the ongoing psychological trauma to the child, their parents, uh, extended families, the community. Say a word about this psychological trauma that is ongoing within the community through this family or these families? Okay, I think I will start by uh, emphasizing that, you know, the essence of our work is the evidence we collect from the field. You know, we interview about 100 children each year and we analyze their testimonies for 13 issues of concern, the time of arrest, the place of arrest, you know, and so on. One important aspect of this evidence that we collect is the direct link between child arrest and settlements. The overwhelming majority of children that we interview live or, or are arrested uh, in locations that are within less than a kilometer from a settlement or a road, by, a road used by settlers. 
So child arrest is a settlement issue. And that's, that's the problem when you move, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, Israeli civilians into occupied territory, you have to guarantee their, uh, their uh, safety and security. And there's no way, there's no nice way of doing it without uh, causing severe uh, harm to the neighbor, to the Palestinians whose land has been taken and where the settlement is built. So the children who get arrested, uh, you know, that the trauma starts from the first moment when, when there's a big loud bang at the front door, you know, soldiers come in massive forces, bang at the front door, sometimes they will break the door, you know, conduct a controlled uh, explosive and blow it open. Sometimes even worse, they will open the door very quietly using a hydraulic device and they will you know, enter the house with while, while their family is asleep. So the trauma starts then. And then the first thing they do is they uh, blindfold the, the person they have identified for arrest and they tie their hands. So they basically uh, deprive them of their senses. And then they leave them, you know, for hours and hours and, and hours. You know, they let their mind mess with them. They will try to, they will only imagine the worst that can happen to them. So this is understandable. These kinds of you know causes that cause trauma, we all understand them. What many of us you know don't appreciate is the trauma afterwards. You know when the yeah. child is released, the family will organize a party, celebrate the homecoming of a child, thinking the party has ended. But almost as soon as the party, I mean the, the the nightmare has ended, almost as soon as the party is over, they realize that the nightmare had just begun. The uh, children show uh, aggressive behavior towards uh, their family and people around them. They don't respect their parents or their, especially the father who was made to feel completely irrelevant and you, hopeless in front of his family. Um, many of these children will isolate themselves. They don't want to sit at the dining table. They don't want to socialize. They sleep during the day and wake up at night, which is a sign of depression. There's, it's a sign of somebody who doesn't know what to do with their lives. Many of them drop out of school because they cannot keep up with their schoolwork, having spent three, four, five months in, uh, in prison. Many of these children, because of the way the system is designed, many of them end up pleading guilty to something they did not do. And this causes severe harm to the uh, psychology or the mentality of the child. You know, we, we all are raised to make a link between our behavior and you know, the response from people around us. So these children claim to be innocent, yet everyone is telling them to plead guilty because that's the quickest way out of the system. You know, yeah. The lawyers are telling them to plead guilty. Their parents are telling them to plead guilty. But it does se severe damage to the children who, whose red lines have been, uh, have been broken. Uh, the impact of child arrest and night, night, uh, night raids is on the entire family, not only on the children. Mothers tell me how they don't sleep at night, they wake up exhausted, and they take turns, somebody sleeps until midnight and then someone else takes uh, over. They show severe symptoms of stress, physical stress, um, you know, stomach ache, headaches and so on. Uh, all this feeds into the already existing issues in the Palestinian society. Like every society, there's violence against women. There's issues uh, inside the family. So if a father is humiliated and a, a child is arrested in a night raid, it's very likely that the dynamics in the family will, uh, um, will be affected. The other day I spoke to a mother who said, my, my uh, husband blames me for the arrest of our son. Uh, he uh, he lost his permit, his, per his work permit was revoked as punishment to the entire family because the son was arrested. He was at home uh, for four months, didn't have uh, any income. And this affected the, the uh, you know, the relationship with, with his wife. And she told me he now wants to divorce me. And not only that, he wants to deprive me of my children. He doesn't want them to, he doesn't want to allow them to to visit me. So all these issues, you know, the political gets entangled with the, with the social and it's one layer upon another of trauma, of uh, fear, of hopelessness, of so on. Thank you very much for that, Saba. Sam, I, I want to come to you with, with another question. Uh, you bring a unique perspective to the work of justice as a Palestinian businessman. 
one of the things you're known for uh, when you speak to groups is you bring out your passport, your residency card, your uh, permits with which you're going to eventually uh, wallpaper your office, you say. Um, uh, you say two things in the film that I'd like you to say more about. You ask a rhetorical question, who's in charge of the pace of our economic development? And you say, time is a weapon in this conflict. Yes, time is a weapon given that Israel is getting a free ride with full impunity on whatever they do. And as long as they have the ability to continue to perfect this occupation, to perfect the human rights violations, uh, we will continue to pay a very, very large price for that. One of the big prices that we pay is our inability to economically develop our society. A lot of times people romanticize about Palestinians. They make, us, they make us out to be supermen and superwomen. We're not. We're normal people who have been put into an unbelievable situation. And it's a prolonged situation, which means we have to wake up every morning and feed our kids and fill our car with gas and pay the tuition and everything else. To be able for 5 million people living under the direct military occupation that we're living under, that requires an economy that can serve this population. For us to be able to do that under international law should be a normal activity. Actually, the occupier has an obligation under international law to facilitate as much as they can to allow the Palestinians to have a normal civil life, which also means an economic life. Um, of course, Israel does not do that. They pay a lot of lip service and put a lot of that well-oiled propaganda to, to talk about what they're doing to make life better. But if you just scratch the surface, which most people won't do, that's why Josh's film and films like it are important, because we can't put our story easily into a Twitter message. It requires an explanation. And if yeah. you scratch the surface of what Israel promotes in terms of we're giving more permits to the Palestinians, uh, we're talking about giving them 4G. That's a three-year discussion now mm -hmm. and ongoing. The last one, 3G, I was part of it. It was a 10-year discussion before we got it, and we only got it after the technology was expired. While they're doing all of that promotion, scratch the surface and you can see a structural de forced dependency that they've created. So we become an extension of the Israeli economy. So when they say they're giving more permits, they're not doing us a favor. They're doing themselves a favor because those workers are going to go and be humiliated across the checkpoint to go inside of Israel to serve Israeli companies for the sake of the Israeli economy. They're able to do that with greater numbers because they're strangling the Palestinian economy more and more every year. So more and more people need jobs. And the Israelis understand the cold calculation that as they strangulate our economy, those people who are becoming unemployed will turn violent if they're not giving an alternative. So Israel gives them the alternative. Come help Israel build its economy. They can't keep up with the pace of those turning to unemployment because there's not enough jobs in Palestine due to these structural restrictions to the point where more and more people are turning violent. And we can see there's an uptick in violence these days, partly because the economy is no, no longer able to serve uh, our population. Add to that corona uh, pandemic, and you have a, a double whammy in terms of how much damage is being done here. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> uh, Yahav, um, increasingly uh, and importantly, uh, Palestinian solidarity organizations are, are recognizing that Israel is a settler colonial regime. B'Tselem, Yeshdin, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, various Christian church denominations in the United States, and others have designated Israel's oppression of Palestinians as apartheid. What's the practical uh, impact of such statements on the ground, and what more needs to be done? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure uh, what the impact is on the ground. Um, I think like the fact that there is a great and systematic and historic wrong going on here is obvious from pretty much any perspective. 
whether you term it a military occupation or you term it an apartheid system or you term it a settler colonial project. I guess different terms appeal to different groups and different mindsets around the world that these organizations are hoping to activate uh, because there is such a failure of the institution that are supposed to. Uh, the United Nations, the so-called international community, uh, to take action against things which are clearly illegal by all their laws, that you're turning to trying to find these different definitions which are valid, uh, but what their implication is on the ground, uh, I'm not sure. I don't okay. know. Thank you. Uh, Sawa? Well, I, I'm not sure either. I mean, my approach is to um, tell the facts as they are in my field and uh, let the people who listen, you know, come up with their own labels if it suits them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sam, what about you and what more needs to be done? I would note uh, that although I agree that there might not be a huge manifestation of what happened after these reports were issued, Partly because the reports just reiterated what the Palestinians have been saying for the last decades. Yeah, this is not we know, new, right? This is yeah, not we, we know there's colonialism. <laughs> we're, we're under it. We know there's occupation. We're the, we're the victims of it. So what the international community did through these human rights organizations is confirm that. I believe it empowered the Palestinian community, at least the institutional part of the Palestinian community. Uh, it also gave uh, a language and tools to be able to articulate further. I mean, when we talk to groups, for example, it's not only Sam's opinion or Selwa's opinion that we're talking about. We can actually say that these mainstream human rights organizations have documented and came out with the same conclusion that we're coming out with. And that's something important, I think, for credibility, especially around uh, groups that are a little bit um, hesitant to accept the Palestinian narrative as factual. We have facts now, actually more facts than we ever thought anybody would collect. Um, actually, there's another level of interesting data coming out, which is from the Israeli uh, community itself. There are several Israeli researchers who have dug into newly released uh, confidential files of the Israeli archives, which have been recently released because of a Freedom of Information Act. And they, too, are issuing reports day in and day out, basically saying war crimes took place. Israel didn't come out of the blue. It came out of a, a mass killing basically. Um, and these documents, interestingly, some of them are being reclassified after the Israeli researchers have wrote about them. Uh, if you try to go to find the reference, you might not find the document anymore. Um, it, these are very powerful uh, uh, relevations of what happened in the kitchen of those carrying out the attacks from 1948 all the way till today. Um, of course, just a footnote here, Netanyahu knew the power of this. He started shredding documents. I mean, Trump took things home. Uh, Netanyahu didn't try to take a chance. He actually started shredding documents in his last period of uh, prime ministership out of fear that some of the decisions that they uh, deliberated would become public information in the future. What needs to happen is to go beyond just reading the reports and shaking our heads. We need to put the information in those reports within a political, political, act, a political actionable item. Ultimately, this is a political conflict par excellence. We're not a laboratory that we can continue to evaluate human rights on. It's a political conflict. These need to become actionable items in front of our lawmakers and actually hold them accountable to this. And that's happening much more than ever before. On the legal front, we can see a lot of legal activity holding Israel accountable, everything from the International Criminal Court all the way to some European countries uh, forcing Israel to stop sending settlement products into the European uh, markets. So there are legal actions being taken. Legal actions alone are not enough. It's too slow of a process, and it's too uh, 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 detailed of a process that will get any immediate result. So we have to go back to our lawmakers and, put, and be in their face, basically. Uh, people need to be elected or not elected partially on how they stand on this issue. Um, and that's a, a, a huge challenge today. If you read what comes out of Congress, for, uh, for example, you, you would think you're hearing uh, deliberations in the Knesset, 
not yeah. in the U.S. Congress. Um, but there's a you know U.S. politics is money and votes, two things that we don't have a lot of as the Palestinian community. But we do have historical fact and international law on our side. We should be using that. And by the way, when I say international law, I would add to that there's a lot of U.S. law that is on our side too. Uh, foreign ex export of arms uh, to countries has rules and regulations. It cannot be used in an aggressive manner. We need to be holding Israel accountable when it kills Sharina Baakli or destroys half of Gaza every couple of years. Thank you, Sam. I think one of the more powerful parts of uh, Josh's film, uh, each one of you raises the subject that most of us who work in Palestinian solidarity are loath to discuss, and that is the presence of Palestinian collaborators, their ubiquity, how they're often intimidated and threatened into becoming informants, and their impact in Palestinian villages and society as a whole. Sawa, you uh, uh, and Gerard talk about this with regard to young people. You want to say a word about it? Sawa? Yeah, it's a it's a big problem, and it's no you know it's a problem that no one wants to acknowledge or talk about. Yet it's so pervasive. It's like having termites in your you know foundations. It's eating us up. You no know, one trusts anybody. Not your neighbor. Not your cousin. Not your classmate. Not your friend. Nobody. And um, the thing is. You know, the information that these people provide can be trivial or irrelevant or useless, but that doesn't really matter because the important thing is that Palestinians know they have been infiltrated. We know that, you know, we have collaborators amongst us and that in itself does the job of inhibiting us. You know, who's going to organize something? Because if you call people for a meeting, who knows how many of them are collaborators or informants? Who knows you know, whether the army will knock at your door the next day and, uh, and arrest you. It has a profound, uh, devastating impact. And Thank it tears the social fabric apart. You know, Palestinians are very, uh, it depend heavily on the social network because we don't have a functioning government for many years that takes care of us in most of the uh, locations. So we depend on each other for help, for financial support, for social support, for everything. And when that is torn apart, we're left with almost nothing. So it, it hits at the very heart of the Palestinians and it serves a purpose to basically uh, frustrate any attempt to organize and to uh, uh, you know, address our life uh, situation. Thank you. Uh, Yaha? Um, yeah, I think it's wherever you have non-democratic government, right? Certainly a military dictatorship, which um, you have this phenomenon um, of secret police uh, pressuring people, using people. Um, it's, of course, it's a terrible tragedy. Uh, for those people who are forced into becoming informants, for their families, for those people they betray. It's, um, it's, of course, it has a terrible effect on a society, on civil society, uh, where you sow distrust systematically uh, between people and their neighbors, between people and their family members, between Um, it's it certainly is is one more piece of a much larger system of which includes uh, the night raids uh, and the arrests of children that is just trying to make fear pervasive uh, and suspicion and uh, to break down society. Yeah. It breaks down society as a resistant force, it also breaks down other aspects of society. Um, and again, I think it's almost, it's almost, it's something that generally happens when you maintain a dictatorship. Certainly for so long, you encounter resistance and you build systems like this. And we can't hope, 
there is no benign tyranny. If you hold <laughs> yeah. people under military government for generations, these things are going to exist and they're going to worsen. Thank and you. To, have, uh, yeah, thank you. Sam, you want to weigh in? Just very briefly, we, we, we need to understand what total control means. Israel has total control over 5 million people where they can go, where they can live, if they have an income or they don't have an income. They can threaten them militarily. They can threaten them sexually. They can threaten them in so many different ways. That total control leads them to be able to use it as a tool of oppression in a very effective way. The more our community goes into poverty, the more we become hopeless, the more that people will do anything they have to do to be able to uh, stay alive, number one, keep their family members alive, and put food on the table. Sadly, that has taken a route which has become very intrusive in all of our cities, all of our villages. Um, however, having said that, even though there's been a, a, a breakdown of the social fabric in Palestine, it remains intact. It's torn apart. It has many holes in it. But there is a bare minimum of social integrity that remains that allows us to be able to uh, kind of understand that this is happening, not have the tools and resources to stop it, but not to be able to engage it full-heartedly as well. So it's something that's there. It's something serving the occupation. And it is by design. It doesn't happen by chance. It's by design. There are people in the Israeli military whose sole task it is, is to find weak Palestinians and try to uh, bring them into the realm of serving the occupation. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. On the film's uh, website, Josh describes the control Israel has over the lives of Palestinians as increasingly, quote, sophisticated, hard to recognize, and sometimes invisible. And we've talked about, you know, so, some of the, uh, the, the more egregious visible parts of the matrix of control, you know, the checkpoints, settlements, and others. But I want you to uh, talk to us about those hard to recognize, sometimes invisible matrices of control. And I'd like for each of you to maybe name one that you think is particularly egregious, that, that's kind of invisible, uh, unless you are a student of, of uh, the issue. So uh, uh, Sam, why don't you start? I think that one needs to realize that, at least in my opinion, this occupation is served to us about 60 plus percent administratively, not militarily, but it, it, it's a military process, but it's, it, it's, it's an administrative uh, order which is taking place. So whether it's permits, for example, the whole permit regime is a very in-depth regime of who gets a permit to go where and when and when you can leave and when you have to be back and which checkpoint you can go out of. This kind of behind the scenes apparatus, matrix of control, if we want to use Jeff Halper's uh, words, um, is very pervasive and uh, uh, affecting every single Palestinian. I would add to that, for example, there are orders on the books in Israel of, for example, how the banking system in Palestine, we use shekels, we use the Israeli shekels. Why? Mainly because we have 200,000 workers going into Israel. They get paid in shekels, Israeli shekels, and they bring them into our community and they spend them at restaurants, at stores, at hotels, etc. Those businesses take those shekels and put them into Palestinian banks. In a normal scenario, banking system, any banking system in a country could take that foreign currency and cash it in at the country who issued it, which is Israel. Israel says, no, that doesn't happen here. You're not allowed to give us back our money. You must keep it. I'm, I serve on a board of a bank. And I can tell you every single bank in Palestine has safes which are overflowing with Israeli shekels. They can't be invested anywhere else, which means every single day we are losing money because Israel won't take back its currency unheard of in the world. One last one I'll give an example of is frequencies. You can't see it, you can't take a picture of it. The, the land is occupied, 
underneath the land, like water is occupied, and the airwaves above us are occupied as well. So they control what kind of technology that we can have. And, uh, and throughout all of that process, there is 24 seven surveillance on everything we do, including the Zoom call. That's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that we don't see every day. Thank you, Sam. Yahav? Well, there, there really is control, as Sam said, on every level. Uh, I think everywhere you look carefully enough, you will see it. Uh, so what is unseen is just what is not paid attention to. It's true of, of water, of fuel, of airspace, of movement, uh, of uh, building, zoning, uh, every aspect. And it's, it's really, again, it's just the, the basic fact of the situation is you're keeping people under military government. You're keeping people under siege. The whole structure of it is you're controlling everything. Thank you. Sawa? Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, um, it's basically like a computer. For your computer to function, you need the hardware, but you also need the software, which is unseen. You don't see it. You don't touch it. But it's very important. It's an essential part of your computer for it to do its job and to function properly. The same with, with occupation. It's a system. There is the hardware, the checkpoints, the wall, the settlements, the soldiers, all of this. But there's also the software, which is hidden, which is you, you, you don't, what you don't see. The you know, numbers of different color IDs that we each have that will restrict us in one way or another. The I don't, I mean, it, it will take a long time to name all of the software tools that the Israeli occupation uh, uh, employs to control us, but it is basically an essential part of the system, exactly like a computer. You need both the hardware and the software for the device to uh, do its job. We're winding down here. I'm aware of the time. I've got another question for all three of you, and then we'll go to Josh, and then the 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 three of you to, for some closing words. So in, in this film, you all do an excellent job describing the mechanisms of oppression. I mean, that was the that was the the, the goal of the film, right? Uh, used by the Israeli military and government. I'd like for you, each one of you to give an example of where you see acts of samud, uh, of persistence, of resistance, signs of hope from within the Palestinian uh, population or other partners of conscience. Um, you know, that, that, that works against, that, that resists those mechanisms of oppression that you so aptly describe in the film. So Yahav, please. Well, the, the problem is that there's so much good work being done. If I start, it's uh, a now, good problem. It's a good all problem, the people who are <laughs> devoting so much yeah. of their energy and courage um, to make small changes, usually incremental changes, uh, there are so many. Um, what would I say? Um, I mean, I just have to give just a general, I, I spend a lot of my time in Palestinian neighborhoods of East Jerusalem. That's not military government officially. That's the normal Israeli government, but there are raids into houses there and there is demolition of homes and there is a, a police violence and there is so many other aspects of this exist there too. A, and yet really, like the overwhelming response is sumud, is people not just going on with their lives and working, but running community centers and building community programs. And again, I'm not gonna start naming because it really is endless. But like if anybody thinks that this is working in the sense of people are just gonna leave or people are giving up, uh, on their Palestinian identity, on their right to live in Jerusalem and have their own communities and have, that's not happening. 
Uh, yeah. So in that sense, that's always been the case in my experience. Uh, the, there's a huge system of oppression, but there is widespread uh, sumud. You know, uh, that that's a helpful response, uh, Yahav, because uh, a number of my Palestinian friends, uh, uh, both within Israel, but also uh, in the Palestinian territories, you know, when, when, when it would be easy for many of them to just emigrate, the mere act of staying and living your lives and raising your kids and going, you know, doing your daily work, that's an act of resistance in and of itself, you know, and so I appreciate your, your reply there. Uh, Salwa, please. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we all admire <laughs> the Palestinian people's ability to persevere and uh, uh, steadfast. Um, you know, there's so many of us doing amazing things from business people to artists to scientists to, uh, you know, workers. We all chip in a little bit, human rights workers. For us to be able to... Um, survive and uh, continue. I mean, the problem is with Sumud, it takes you only so far. We need to be not, not only, you know, um, Sumud, you know, experience, you know, practicing Sumud, but we also need to come up with a, with a proactive policy. You know, it's very yeah. important that we remain on the land, that we continue our lives, that we pursue our dreams. But unfortunately, Sumud, I don't think will uh, liberate us. Um, I hate to. Sumud's, Sumud's <laughs> I, not I, yet a I political to... strategy that Sam was talking about. It is not before. a strategy. It is yeah, not yeah. a strategy. It's not enough. We you know it's admirable, but it is not enough. You know, if you ask me what is the, a proactive uh, strategy, I don't think I can come up with one. First, I mean, it starts with good leadership. We need good. Uh, democratically elected leadership for us to have a funk, you know, viable, proactive uh, 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 policy that will lead us somewhere. And I will pass it on to Sam. I think he might have better <laughs> ideas. <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciated you saying that because Samud, like I said, and forgive me for interrupting you before, but Samud's not yet a political strategy toward an end game, as uh, you all have been suggesting. Sam, please. You're absolutely correct. Samud is a survival mechanism. It's a coping mechanism. Our success is being here, is living as a Palestinian people. Anybody who's read the Palestinian history would, would come to the conclusion these people should not exist. It was meant to, they were meant to be wiped out. And we're not only standing on our feet, we're also actively resisting the occupation. And while we're doing that, we were able to muster the support of the international community to the tune of the majority of the countries of the world recognizing the state of Palestine, even though it's militarily occupied. This is all very, very important stuff. If you ask me the one thing that gives me hope, it's Palestinian civil society. Palestinian civil society at many different levels these days are acting like never before. The teachers are in the streets asking and demanding not only for the end of occupation, but for accountability in the Palestinian government for their rights. Uh, judges and teachers, uh, judges and lawyers are doing the same. Uh, healthcare workers are doing the same. Engineers are doing the same. The last six months, all the ones I just mentioned have been in the streets in the thousands uh, and not only demonstrating, but really challenging the poor leadership that we have today inside the Palestinian community. And these are clusters of uh, professionals that are highly engaged in providing us the samud needed to be able to resist this occupation. Our teachers are making sure our kids are getting an education when everything Israel is doing is making sure that education is not given to the next generation. Healthcare workers are making sure the hospitals are open, even though Israel makes it very difficult for hospitals to operate here, et cetera, et cetera. So civil society no longer being complicit to the silence that we've been used to in our community, is something very, very positive to look for. What yet needs to be done is all of this work to be translated into a political program. And as Salwa correctly said, that requires leadership. And we in civil society 
are challenging the current leadership for holding elections and bringing forth a new generation of leaders. And it's pulling teeth. It's not easy work. People have paid physical prices for trying to do this. Uh, but it's definitely a train that has left the station and leadership will be renewed here. But luckily, international law doesn't say that our leadership needs to be polished before the global community can act against the occupier. So we as Palestinians have internal politics too. Surprise, surprise. While we're dealing with our internal politics, and I, as an American, I can tell you we have internal politics in the States as well, right? Oh, really? Those internal politics continue while the bigger issues also, the international issues get addressed. So no one should use the excuse, the lame excuse, that Palestinians are not unified. They have varying opinions. Oh, really? I, I thought we were different than the rest of the world. No, we have different opinions. We have splits in our political system. That doesn't mean for a second anyone should allow this military occupation to proceed for one more day, let alone one more hour. Thank you, Sam. Josh, uh, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on what you've heard, what we've been discussing, as well as tell us a little bit about uh, your work and uh, uh, the future uh, for uh, the Law and the Prophets. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, Sam, Saul, and Yahav, as always. Um, you know, it, Israel-Palestine has its own very particular conditions and injustices, but I'm starting to feel like internationally, the sorts of struggles happening in Israel-Palestine are happening in many, many places. And it's a time really for people of integrity, honesty, and, and decency and good faith to stand up and risk. You have to risk friendships. You have to risk financial stability. Um, you have to risk your job. You have to risk family relationships. Um, if you think these things matter, you know, and to me, human rights, justice, international law, these things are important and people need to risk for them. You need to risk in your community. You need to risk in your country and you need to risk internationally. Otherwise, the other side uh, just shows no signs of relenting, either in Israel and, and, you know, like Sam said, in the United States. I mean, we're fighting for democracy in the United States. I think that's just a fact. Um, so my call to people is to stand up. If you're a person of honesty, integrity, decency, whatever kind of faith ba background you are, now's your moment. We're all being given an opportunity. Um, if Israel Palestine is the thing you're passionate about, do it about that. Great. If racism in the United States is something you're passionate about, fight for that and, and be willing to lose, but don't be willing to give up. Um, Cornell West uh, taught me a really important lesson, not personally through a podcast. And he just said, sometimes winning is just maintaining a high quality struggle. And that's a win in and of itself. And um, that might just be our task. This generation's task might just be maintaining the high quality good struggle. And we might not see victory, but there's a kind of victory in maintaining that struggle. Um, so I would just push everybody, stand out, be different. Josh, be uh, we have a number of folks who are activists on this call in their various denominations and various communities. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if they wanted to contact you to screen this film in their local communities uh, or invite you to come or uh, any of our guests and speak, how will they get in touch with you? Probably the easiest way is just go to uh, my website, joshvis.com. Pretty easy to remember. And you can find a way to contact me there. You can email me directly. It's joshuamvis at gmail.com. Um, so there's lots of ways to find me. I'm happy to come and we can screen this film in a theater. Um, I'm happy to give you access to it if you have a group that wants to watch it. Uh, I've been trying to get it into film festivals. So far, I have not had any luck, though I've gotten a lot of praise for the film, but not gotten it into a festival yet. I'm waiting on just two more. But I'm not going to hide this film behind any paywalls or anything. Eventually, uh, it's going to be on the website. 
um, we're redoing it and we're going to put it on the website and it will be pay what you can, including zero to watch it because I didn't make this film to make money or for fame. Uh, I made it to honor these folks and to help the cause in any way that I could that I can. Um, so it might take a little while for it to be just openly available on the Internet to everyone, but eventually it will be. I can assure you of that. Well, you and I had discussed uh, this uh, in preparation for today and uh, uh, your willingness and openness to, to disseminate it widely. And of course, it deserves uh, to be disseminated widely. These voices, uh, uh, these, these important, brave voices need to be uh, heard uh, around the world. So thank you. Uh, I'm yeah, going to... Thanks I'm to everybody who, thanks everybody here who participated. Thanks to everybody who watched it. And please, if you think this is a film that other people will like, please get in contact with me. We'll find a way. And eventually, as I said, it'll be available widely. I'm going to let uh, Sawa, Sam, and Yahab have the last word. But before I do, I, I want to once again uh, thank our co-sponsors, uh, Friends of Sabeel North America, Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church USA, United Church of Christ, Palestine-Israel Network, Kairos West Michigan, United Methodist for Kairos Response, and Voices from the Holy Land. So thanks to all of you. And a reminder that today's interview has been recorded and it will be posted on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace uh, YouTube channel. And I'll be sharing it with Josh and the participants and all the co-sponsors as soon as we can get it uh, made into a YouTube. I also want to let you know about our upcoming program on Wednesday, September 21st. Our guest will be Kairos USA's Mark Braverman. As you know, Mark writes movingly about Christian Kairos response in Nazi Germany, South Africa, the U.S. South, and in Palestine. We'll be having a wide-ranging conversation, although we're going to focus on Mark's recent important essay, Theology in the Shadow of the Holocaust, Revisiting Bonhoeffer and the Jews. And in this essay, uh, 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 Mark discusses uh, how, how uh, this conversation about Bonhoeffer has led to Jewish exceptionalism and absolutist Christian support for the state of Israel. So that's on Wednesday, September the 21st, and we're advertising that on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace Facebook page. So we hope you'll share the news of, the, of this upcoming program with your friends. So uh, parting words, uh, Yahav. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael, for doing this. Thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you for everybody who participated and listened. Um, I want to thank Josh also for making the movie. And um, look, in the end, I think we, we'd really like all of you to come here, of course, and see things for yourselves. But I think if you've gotten this far to this viewing, you pretty much have a clear idea uh, that the US uh, foreign policy and US money is involved here in a way that does not represent what Americans stand for uh, or should, uh, and that action is needed, political action is needed uh, there where you are, in the US, in your local elections, in your uh, communities, in your churches. Um, I, I really hope that this kind of interaction will ultimately contribute uh, to, to people taking action in the U.S. Thank you. You have Salwa. Well, I want to uh, thank everyone, especially Josh and his team for the enormous effort. This uh, film is an amazing resource. It's a fantastic educational um, tool. I personally learned a lot. I learned from uh, Yahav, I learned from Sam, from the other uh, you know, speakers who took part in the film. And I would definitely highly recommend it. I wish you all the best of luck, Josh, in uh, 
putting it up there. I think it will take off. One day it will take off. And the huge amount of effort and dedication and sincere um, belief in the injustice and in the, you know, in our cause is very clear, comes through in every second of the film. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Salwa. Sam? My words would be, we must get political. There's many ways to be in solidarity with the Palestinians. You can financially support, you can be in the solidarity movement, you can be in the legal efforts that are happening in different areas. You can work in the academic field, the legal cases. There's so many places one can interact. Ultimately, that has to all convert into getting political. And I would say getting political means two different things. Getting political and challenging powers to be on the issue of Palestine specifically, and getting political, holding our lawmakers accountable to their own laws in their own countries, which would support, of course, uh, freedom for Palestine. Uh, in the U.S., there's many places to start, starting with campaign financing, uh, how nonprofits get tax deductible status. We need to turn those into political debates and make it very embarrassing for lawmakers that continue to blindly support Israel with no strings attached. Uh, and the more we get political, the more we'll see people stepping forward. We already have a handful of people in Congress that have done that. They've stepped forward. We need to support them and show them that there is a winning strategy by speaking truth to power. And again, we're not starting from zero. We've been at this. There's been new traction uh, and we just need to uh, double down because ultimately there's no silver bullet. There's hard works rolling up our sleeves and getting very political in what we do. Thank you, everyone. Um, Josh, a special thank you to, to you. Uh, to Marlon and Sally, your parents, uh, for their support and work uh, with you in creating this film. It uh, deserves a wide screening. It's important uh, and a powerful film. And so thank you, Josh, uh, for uh, offering this and for making yourself available to our audience and even beyond. And I want to say thanks to all of you for joining us today. And I look forward to your joining us for our upcoming programs. Thank you, everyone.